welcome Lisa Ryan um, to speak about this extraordinary campaign um, and uh, she'll be presenting and discussing um, animal liberations investigation into camels and animals in the Australian animal tourism sector. Uh, Lisa will also be discussing animal liberations, breaking the camels back campaign origins, timeline of events, campaign goals, next steps, and how you can help Australian camels. Thank you so much, Lisa. Over to you. Thank you, um, and hello to everybody. Um, it's it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to recognise some wonderful animal supporting people in the audience. Um, before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians from the lands of which I'm presenting, um, lands which have never been ceded, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Before um, we start the presentation, um, it, it's appropriate uh, for me to make some thank yous and some acknowledgements. Our Camels campaign has been three years in the making, um, and the word that probably best describes it is harrowing, as well as frustrating. Um, the, the first party I need to acknowledge and thank is our whistleblower. Without our whistleblower, we would not have um, a lot of the evidence that forms part of our investigation. Um, and they have been extraordinarily patient with us. They have trusted us with the information they shared. So we are indebted to them uh, and for their confidence in how we needed to pursue our campaign. I also want to thank Linda Stoner and our board, uh, particularly for their trust and confidence in me um, moving this campaign forward and um, occasionally um, challenging me to look at things and questioning things, but always for the right reasons. Uh, Linda, your support for me and the immediate campaign team uh, is recognised and we thank you for it. Um, I would also like to thank our extraordinary lawyers, uh, Tara Ward and Andrew Joyce from the Animal Defenders Office, who have provided extraordinary guidance, not only on the law, but also understanding as animal activists themselves, the campaign and what animal liberation is all about. Um, Tara and Andrew have been at my beck and call. They have provided the most extraordinary uh, support information um, and we thank them sincerely. Um, I also would like to recognise um, our immediate campaign team, um, uh, Roscoe, um, Alex, who has been an absolute rock to me in the last couple of weeks of a very, very stressful period, um, Cara, who has been, is fairly new to animal liberation and has just absolutely provided support um, day and night to get this campaign ready to launch. I would also like to acknowledge a former team member of Animal Liberation, Nadia Kirtens. Um, there is much of Nadia's heart and soul and love in this campaign. She did an enormous amount of work and we wouldn't be in the position we are now with uh, years of dedicated work from Nadia. Finally, I want to recognise uh, our next speaker, um, Teresa, uh, and also another um, animal sanctuary lady by the name of Ling McAllister, who have been gracious and giving in allowing me to use a whole lot of their um, beautiful videos of camels at their sanctuaries and their footage. Um, that's those acknowledgements were important because of the significance of this campaign and what it means to every member of animal liberation. 
Um, I will not be showing any graphic footage tonight. There will be a couple of images, but I'm I'm we've been careful in in what we put to you. Um, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to give you a better understanding about camels and what incredible, wonderful creatures they are, but also about our campaign and where we need you to help us move it forward. Uh, next, thank you, Alex. So tonight I'm going to cover um, briefly uh, animals in the tourism sector, the Australian tourism landscape and how it relates to camels, camels themselves and camels in Australia, the issues facing Australian camels. Um, briefly, I'm going to touch on the legislation and the challenges we're going to face and I'm going to give you a bit of an understanding of why this campaign has taken three years work um, and go through where we're trying to go. What are what is our purpose? What are our objectives um, and why we've gone public, uh, including what our campaign facts and evidence are about and then what's next with this campaign. Thank you, Alex. So just briefly, and I, I'm sure this won't come to as a surprise to anybody in the audience, animals in the tourism sector is a global issue. Um, we have all heard about the drugged tigers where people take selfies. We know about the elephant rides. We know about um, the camel rides in Egypt and other parts of the world. Um the issues are the same globally. It's about normally wild, free-roaming animals that are captured and then put into a position where they are conditioned and trained to perform a certain way for human entertainment and profit. Um, the issue for camels and camel rides in Australia is all part of that. So... Um, some some animals in the tourism sector also come under spectator sports, so camel racing, for example. But it is a global issue. It is very significant. Uh, and when we're talking about wild animals, it's a whole lot of different welfare issues compared to domestic animals. So if you capture a wild horse, for example, they are normally referred to, they, they are considered domestic animals. But if it's a wild horse like a Brumby, it's going to react and behave a very different way. If you're talking about a tiger or an elephant or a free-roaming camel, the risks and the impacts to them and the way they respond to that captivity and that trapping are very different. Uh, next, thank you, Alex. So just briefly, tourism is huge in terms of economic benefit to Australia. It's massive and it always has been and that's been increasing. So tourists from around the world are normally attracted to Australia's wide and open spaces, our beautiful beaches, our beautiful snow fields, the countryside, and in particular, our very unique native animals uh, because they live nowhere else in the world. Most people around the world will recognise a kangaroo and a koala, for example. But even our so-called protected native species are caught up in animal tourism. And there has been a number of um, exposures normally through the media of people going to wildlife parks and they will pay, I don't know, $20 to take a selfie with a koala. Koalas are wild animals. They should not be handled like that. It's extremely stressful for them. Um, and these type of attractions are normally happening in remote type locations. So there is a lack of oversight and monitoring and therefore if there are breaches to the animal protection laws 
or the way the animals are being treated, they are rarely, if ever, reported and investigated. So the issues just, you know, continue. Uh, next, thank you, Alex. So just to give you an understanding of how big tourism is to Australia, in 2006, approximately 2.2 million of Australian inbound tourists visited wildlife tourist attractions. So that accounts for 43% of all international tourists. So that is huge. So that tells you how much money is involved and the economic value. I think it's probably important also to mention that when the world was locked down during COVID, to, the tourism industry was hit very, very hard and it's still just managing to get back up on its feet. So it's very important to the government. They throw a lot of money at it. They support it. They encourage it. But what we've uncovered is that when it comes to animals, there is a lack of oversight and regulation. Next, thank you, Alex. So just briefly, camels are clearly not domestic animals. They are wild animals and invariably, whether it's for camel rides, for camel dairies, for camel exports, for meat, um, they are trapped into a life of slavery and servitude. And that is uh, a truthful statement. They are free roaming animals and then they're mustered, trapped to do whatever humans find useful or want from them. Next. So in Australia, camels were brought in um, via the Canary Islands back in 1840. So they've been here for a long period of time. They were brought in primarily to become beasts of burden, to carry things for um, people that were building, people that were travelling, um, transporting goods. There are now over one million camels in Australia, predominantly in the Northern Territory of Australia. Next, please. In Australia, animals, ac according to whatever label our government applies to them, and I'm talking about labels like feral or pest, that label determines how we treat them. And it determines the laws that protect them or don't protect them. And it also determines how they can be killed, um, what methods of killing, what control methods are used. In the Northern Territory, there is um, where the largest population of camels exist, there is both aerial and ground shooting ongoing. Uh, huge numbers are slaughtered. There is uh, exports going from Northern Territory. And this is an interesting point, and I will pick this up further down the track, but I've been also looking at camel exports and the Northern Territory are making claims of um, 50,000 camels being exported from the Northern Territory every year. When I went to the Commonwealth Government Department and said these figures couldn't possibly be right, and I looked at the Commonwealth Government's export numbers, and they have to record everything for biosecurity, for vaccination records, for the export numbers, where are they going? And the Commonwealth Government's data told me that over a five-year period, about 100 had been exported. Now, since then, I have been back and forth between the Northern Territory Government and the Commonwealth Government, and I still haven't got to the truth. And Andre's earlier comment, which made me laugh about a combative relationship, 
I have that in spades with most government departments right across Australia because they do deflect, they do try and frustrate you so you go away. Animal Liberation and myself don't go away from anything until we get to the truth. Um, next, please, Alex. Briefly, um, and I don't know how much people know about camels. I am absolutely not an expert in camels, but the more I read, the more I look, the more I learn, I am absolutely entranced with, with these wonderful sentient beings. They are highly sentient. They are highly intelligent. They have great memories. They are they are very connected with their family members. And it's because of all of those factors that we have been driven to work as hard as we have to put together our campaign and go public with it. Next, please. So in terms of camel rides and tourism, the high level issues for camels, which are wild animals, is the mustering and trapping process. It is highly stressful for them. They don't know what's happening. Um, they are taken from what they're familiar with, often in um, circumstances that we would find abhorrent. And our campaign footage, which is graphic, but it is truthful, shows the mustering process for the Uluru camels. Um, and it's a hard watch. And I can tell you for myself and my colleagues who have watched this footage over and over and over again, looking for issues um, and trying to prepare our campaign, I don't think there's been an occasion where I've watched this footage where I haven't broken down in tears. Um, and that that's the truth. The trap yards are an issue because... Um, sometimes the trap yards may not be built according to what is suitable for camels. They might be cattle trap yards. And camels and cattle are very different beings. Um, in the conditioning process and the training process to get these camels to become servants and submissive, um, there can be a denial to food and water, and that is to break their spirits, that is to weaken them, and that is to make them submissive where they just give up and they think, okay, I'll stand up, I'm going on another ride, and that, that is their lot in life. The surgical procedures um, are difficult to watch on our footage, um, but these su surgical procedures do occur. Uh, most camels on camel treks, you will see a nose peg in their nose, and our footage shows how those nose pegs are inserted. Um, and those nose pegs, it's not just the initial discomfort of having it shoved into a very sensitive part of your nose that nose peg by pulling the rope attached to that peg causes a camel pain every time it's pulled. And that is what is used to control them. And in the camel rides, that nose peg is tied to the camel in the front. So if it's dragging its heels, it gets pulled along because it's the pain that's stimulating them to move forward. The tethering and hobbling uh, is also very difficult to watch, but it happens. And um, the slide you can see, you can see the straps around their leg. That is to control them and keep them still and keep them submissive. The housing for the camel, certainly the ones we've investigated, most of the pens were very barren. Um, many of the pens had no shade or shelter. And while camels come from desert environments and they can cope with some heat. Research shows us 
that when it gets to a certain condition, they seek out shade and shelter. So to not, and the Northern Territory is a pretty hot climate and with climate change, it's getting hotter. So for these camels to be exposed to those conditions all the time, you can imagine their discomfort. Next slide, please. So this is just briefly, and we, we have a number of um, quotes, statements by our whistleblower from the campaign on our uh, webpage, our Breaking the Camels Back webpage. This is one of them. We were trained to lie to the tourists about the welfare of the camels. Um, now, that's not animal liberation statement. That is from a whistleblower who had um was in a good position to to see things to observe things and to report them back to us next please alex so now i'm going to talk about the campaign um and the subheading is along an arduous road and it has been um literally 3 years ago we were contacted by a whistleblower who spoke about what they had seen um, with their own eyes, um, information that they had available to them, some footage. Um, and from that, we did an initial review um, and it was our view that the whistleblower was providing factual, truthful information and we had an obligation to investigate our first port of call, and this goes back to February 2021, we lodged a formal complaint. Um, the complaint pretty much went nowhere, like happens with a lot of animal welfare complaints we put in, and we chased and we chased and we chased. Um, the Northern Territory Animal Welfare Branch then commenced an investigation, including an inspection of the Uluru Camel Tours um, uh, tourist setup. Um, while they were doing that, we were looking into, we were doing all of our research, um, what's been going on, reviewing the footage, is there any other related, has there been other related complaints about this property? Um, at that time, two Animal Lib investigators also went to the Northern Territory for eyewitness observations, um, include, which is where we also collected a lot of our evidence um, with footage, um, talking to people, our witness, our whistleblower, we then linked up with um, uh, the government department that we're investigating and they provided a very comprehensive statement. Um, and then we started documenting and compiling the extent of the issues to see how we could put a campaign together. But that took that took a long period of time. There was a huge amount of information we had to investigate. Um, next, please, Alex. When we assessed everything, we then had to make a call on the merits of the campaign. It was always our view that this campaign and these camels deserved a campaign. Um, we were continuing to touch base with the Northern Territory Animal Welfare Branch about where they were up to. At the end of their investigation, and it was very slow, very drawn out, very protracted, and we were on their case constantly, but ultimately they did lay animal cruelty charges. Um, there were three charges against the owner of the tourism operation and one against an employee. Then we went into a period of it being listed for a court hearing. It was adjourned twice, and this is over many, many, many months. Um, it was adjourned twice, 
and then in the final the final court date which was february 2022 the charges were withdrawn so it never went before the courts um that was when we started lodging freedom of information applications um and we were relentless in doing that um so there were three and one of those um came back we're not going to give you any information and i demanded a review in all instances we've been blocked from getting information but we have i can assure you um tried every which way in getting to the truth and understanding why these cruelty charges were withdrawn. And I can tell you, because it is the truth, that our footage was provided. So what some of you have already watched and probably been shocked by that footage was provided to the Animal Welfare Department when we lodged our initial complaint in 2021. Next, please, Alex. Just briefly, and I'm not going to go into this because legislation to most people is boring, but I wanted to put this up to, and most of you, to, well, I guess to clarify that with all of this legislation, None of it protects camels. None of it has ensured that what we have documented, our footage, our statements, our own investigations, none of this legislation did anything to protect these camels or ensure that justice was served. The cruelty charges were withdrawn. A judge didn't even get to hear them. The public didn't get any transparency. Now, as most of you would know, most of our legislation across Australia is state-based, but we do have, um, so in um, at a Commonwealth level, we have the National Feral Action Plan, which is pretty much a copy and paste of the National Pig um action plan and the national deer action plan they just keep rolling them out for any any species that they think you know they don't they don't deserve to live and they don't deserve a place on on australian soil they roll out an action plan and the control methods and the lethal control methods are appalling absolutely appalling and there's one for camels and again they're called feral camels the model code of practice for the welfare of animals, the camel, is also a national type code of practice. Like all codes of practice across Australia, it's not worth the paper it's written on. They are not standards enforced by law. They are guidelines. It is not mandatory. So a camel operator can read it and completely ignore it. And again, no one's enforcing it. I'm not even sure that that model code has even been gazetted at government level. The other legislation, um, the, the Animal Welfare Act 2018, um, has been repealed and replaced by another uh, Northern Territory Animal Welfare and Protection Act but it was the Animal Welfare Act 2018 under which the cruelty charges were laid and it no longer. Now, it, it was like most of our animal welfare legislation, it's weak, it's inadequate, um, it, it, it does nothing. Um, it's full of a whole lot of exemptions for different animals according to the species. And the newer Northern Territory legislation is not much better um, they did review the regulations that sit under that Act back in 2022. They're not great either. Um, what it all comes down to is none of this has protected the camels. And with all of it, there is a complete and utter lack of monitoring and enforcement. Next, please. So what's next? Okay. 
We've rolled out our campaign and our campaign page, uh, which we've spent a lot of time on, um, is there. The purpose of that campaign page is to educate people about animals in tourism and our focus at the moment is camels. It will broaden, but at the moment it's about these camels and weight raising awareness so that any of you, any of your family or friends are thinking of, you know, taking a trip to the Northern Territory uh, or anywhere else and there are camel rides on offer that you will say, no, thank you, I don't support that, and that you will help to educate other people. Um, we are involved in ongoing investigations um, and I won't go into too much detail, but I can tell you that, um, again, through a formal complaint I lodged with um, a different department in the Northern Territory Government, um, there is an uh, matter involving a petting zoo and the petting zoo includes some native species. So that is under investigation and I can tell you we will not let that drop. We are working on an ethical tourism guide that we would like to see put together, published and in every tourism ticket seller's shop um, we would like to see our tourism guide on every counter in every hotel where people go up to the Northern Territory and they've got all these brochures for take a balloon ride or do this or do that. We want our ethical tourism guide there and it will cover more than just camels. Um, we would like to see billboards up in the Northern Territory airports that when domestic or international tourists are arriving, they can look up and it will, could be a simple message of um, do you understand uh, how the camels feel or um, these are the questions to ask the operator before you consider taking a camel ride. Um, the political action is something we always do with our campaigns and our campaign petition is targeting the Federal Minister for Agriculture, Murray Watt, to reform the laws and to regulate camel tour operator businesses, not just in the Northern Territory, but right across Australia. If any of you after this meeting or tomorrow or when you have time, you put in to Google Camel rides, you will find them in New South Wales, in South Australia, in Victoria. There are quite a few of them. So most people aren't aware. Um, next question. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. So what you can do in finishing up is please support and share our campaign. We understand that the footage is graphic. Uh, it is embedded in my head probably for the rest of my life. Um, we understand people who can't watch that footage, but you can still share the campaign, ask people to sign our petition, ask people to sign our pledge. It is so important. And for those that are in a position to donate so we can start putting money together for our tourism, ethical tourism guide for billboards, for whatever we can do to alert people and raise awareness, it will help us. You can sign everything that we we put out to you um, and we will be sending an email out tomorrow. You can share the expose even if you don't feel comfortable or are unable to watch the footage. You can still share it. Um, donate if you can. Um, this is a really hard campaign because most people aren't interested in camels, but they are amazing, amazing beings. A camel is as intelligent as an eight-year-old child, just to put that into proper perspective. You can also offer to volunteer. The more campaigns myself and my colleagues take on, 
the more stretched we are. And I don't know that any of us um, can work any more hours than we're working. Um, and that's not from lack of dedication, I can assure you. But anybody that can put their hand up and say, hey, I can give you, you know, um, four hours a fortnight, Lisa, I will grab you with both arms and not let go. Um, next slide. So thank you. Now, this beautiful, beautiful image is a rescue camel um, from Lynn McAllister's sanctuary. Um, and that is Lynn McAllister in the picture. And we have lots of beautiful graphics that we're going to be sharing with you over the next few weeks. And this camel gives kisses. He is just magnificent. They're all magnificent. And I'm really happy we've got Teresa as a speaker next on a um, a happier note than, than this campaign. As I said, the campaign has been absolutely harrowing and gut-wrenching for the entire animal liberation team, and I know it's affected me, um, but I am so determined, so determined to get a federal government inquiry into animals in the tourism industry and shake them all up. And if that means my combative relationships with government departments heighten, so be it for the animals.